indeed, the truth is that I missed you all last Sunday. It is, of course, good to be away. It's good for you all to hear a fresh voice from the pulpit. However, it is even better to be back. So, let's pick up where we left off when last we were together with the book of Esther. Shall we consider Esther chapter 7? The chapter is but 10 verses, so we shall read all 10 verses for our consideration as well as for our edification as we seek to live for Christ over the next seven days until we come back together again. So Esther chapter 7. Now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther the queen. And the king said to Esther on the second day also as they drank their wine at the banquet, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request, even to half of the kingdom? It shall be done. Then Queen Esther replied, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my wife be given me as my petition, and my people as my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Now, if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent, for the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance of the king. Then King Ahasuerus asked Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who would presume to do thus? Esther said, A foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman became terrified before the king and the queen. The king arose in his anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm had been determined against him. By the king. Now, when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he even assault the queen with me in the house? As the word went out from the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs, who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king, and the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. This is the word of God for us on this day, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? Oh God, indeed, help us, I pray. Inspire us, I ask. May we be impelled due to our time together now on an ordinary Sunday in August. May we be impelled to go out here and live righteous lives. May we be impelled to do the right thing tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and on. Whether our actions receive what they deserve or not. However, we are reminded and we thank you for those times when our actions do indeed receive what they deserve. And it is in Jesus' name that we give you thanks for this day. It is in Jesus' name that we give you thanks for the fact that our heart is pumping as well as our lungs. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So as your pastor, I want to push each and every one of you, each participant in the flock, in the community 
that is FBC Husky, I want to push us all towards righteous living. I spend a significant amount of time during the week in scriptures, in study, preparing Bible studies, preparing sermons, pushing myself to righteous living. And then when I have the privilege once every seven days of standing before you and addressing you, I want to push you towards righteous living. As Christians, we should become very intimate. As Christians, we should become very familiar with the teachings of Jesus. Let me remind you of a few. We are to pray for our enemies. We are to pray for those who persecute us. We are to turn the other cheek. We are to give to the poor. We are not to bow down to the God, little g, of greed. So we become intimate with the teachings of Jesus, and then we go out into the world, and we live out the teachings of Jesus. Now, I offer you a bit of incentive today. It is not easy to turn the other cheek. Have you tried it lately? It is not easy to live a humble life. Have you tried it lately? The temptations of money and greed are so strong. Don't you know that? The Christian life is not easy to live. In fact, it is very much like going into an elevator and standing in the opposite direction from everyone else. You will feel silly and stupid, and it is very difficult to do. And that is what it is like living for Christ in this world. However, as a little incentive today, I share with you that sometimes when we pursue righteousness, things go our way. Let me say that to you again, that sometimes when we pursue righteousness, sometimes when we make good decisions, sometimes when we do the right thing, things go our way. Now, indeed, things do not always go our way when we pursue righteousness. Things do not always go our way when we do the right thing and when we make good decisions. But sometimes they do. Do you know Billy Joel's song, Only the Good Die Young? He says, I'd rather laugh with the sinners and cry with the saints because only the good die young. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints because only the good die young. Indeed, sometimes the good die young. But listen to me, church. Sometimes the good live to be an old, ripe age. Sometimes when we do the right thing, sometimes when we make the right decisions, sometimes when we turn the other cheek, Sometimes when we pray for our enemy, things will go our way. Sometimes. So notice, if you will, from Esther chapter 7, that in the words of Psalm 1, Esther chapter 7 seems to put flesh for me at least on the words of the first psalm, the righteous prosper and the wicked perish. Notice from Esther chapter 7 that sometimes it goes this way, that the righteous prosper and the wicked perish. Notice what happens to Haman here. And I'd like to encourage you. We had a nice discussion several Wednesday nights ago about all of the humor that is in the book of Esther. It is a hilarious document. It is perhaps one of the funniest documents in all of the Bible. I don't tend to think of the Bible as a book of humor or documents of humor, but boy, do we have it in the story of Esther. So notice, if you will, in Esther chapter 7, what happens to Haman. Esther gives her request, finally, at this second banquet. Notice verse 3. 
Then Queen Esther replied to the king, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given as my petition and my people as my request. So this is what Esther wants from the king. Remember, she took the risk. She went into his presence without having been summoned. There's been one banquet, and now there's a second banquet. And now Queen Esther lets it fly, and she says that I want my life and the life of my people saved. So verse 4, For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Now, if we had been sold as slaves, men and women, I would not have remained silent, for the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance of the king. It's a nice way of saying, Esther says, look, King Ahasuerus, if I and my people had just been sold into slavery, I wouldn't bug you with this. But the fact is, we have been sold into death. We are to be annihilated in a year's time, so I'm asking for your interference. I'm asking for your intervention. Now, when the king hears about this, because he likes Esther so much, notice what the king does in verse 7. He becomes very angry. Well, first, verses 5 and 6, right, Haman is identified. Then King Ahasuerus asked Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who would presume just to presume to do such? And Esther, she's a smart lady. She's a smart woman. And she's waiting for just the right moment. Timing is everything. And she seems to know this. And here, the moment has presented itself and she doesn't back down. Verse 6, Esther said, a foe and the enemy is this wicked Haman. That Haman became terrified before the king and the queen. So now King Ahasuerus knows that Haman is the one after Queen Esther's life and the lives of her people. He becomes angry in verse 7. The king arose in anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. So notice the irony. In verse 8, Haman is pleading for his life. He's apparently kneeling at a couch where the queen is for his life. The king has stepped out. The king comes back in, and it doesn't look kosher to him. And he says, what? You mean even in my absence, Haman, you're going to try to assault my queen? So he's begging for his life, Haman is. And then the irony in verse 10, he didn't get his request, Esther got hers. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which had been prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. So you see this. You see this, church. Haman's actions received exactly what they deserved. Wicked Haman is hung on the gallows that he prepared for righteous Mordecai. Wicked Haman is hung on the gallows that he prepared for righteous Mordecai. And sometimes, not all the time, there are no guarantees. I hear you, I hear you. Sometimes the good do die young, but sometimes the good live to an old ripe age. Sometimes when we pursue righteousness, things go in our way. Sometimes. Now, notice Mordecai, if you will. His name is only mentioned twice in chapter 7, uh, in verse 9 and in verse 10. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, the gallows standing in Haman's house, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. Do you remember that? Back in chapter 2, right? You had these two cats, these two guys, who were planning to do evil against King Ahasuerus. Mordecai overhears this 
And he reports it to Queen Esther, who reports it to King Ahasuerus, and the danger is removed from before the king. Perhaps his life was saved. So Mordecai is doing all of the right things here. And then Haman is hung on the gallows and not Mordecai himself. Notice how chapter 8 begins. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman. Notice this. If you're drifting, come back with me. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman the enemy of the Jews to Queen Esther, and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had disclosed what he was to her, her relative. Then king, the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken away from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Haman got what he deserved for his wicked deeds, Mordecai got what he deserved for his righteous deeds. And sometimes, listen to me, I can't promise you, I can't make any guarantees, but sometimes when we pursue righteousness, when we do the right thing, it goes in our direction. So each Sunday I stand up here and I do my best as your pastor. And I do my best to set the example, though I fall short. But I do my best to push you to righteous living, to applying the teachings of Jesus to your life day in and day out, to turning the other cheek, to living with humility, to giving to the poor, to not bowing to the God of greed, to push you towards all of these things, loving your neighbor as yourself. Push you to love yourself so you can love your neighbor. And we do this no matter what. Whether our actions get what they deserve or not, this is what we do. But oh, sometimes, sometimes it goes our way. But not all the time. I remember, I remember track practice in middle school. Coach told us that when we were to run, we were to go around the perimeter of the baseball field, the perimeter of the softball field. We were not to cut right field out, right? She, she wanted us to run. She wanted us to be in shape. She wanted us to improve. And so we were to run around the perimeters of the baseball field and the softball field. I was raised in a very rural area, so part of the course that she had us to run went through the woods. And we were told that when we got into the woods, because, well, you can't see what's happening in the woods, we were not to stop and walk, but we were to continue to run. You know what I did? I did exactly what that coach told me. I ran around the perimeter of the baseball field. I ran around the perimeter of the softball field. When we got into the woods and she couldn't see me, I kept on running. One of my very close friends, who will remain nameless, because sermons these days go up on our church website, but if you happen to listen, you know who you are. One of my best friends, you know what he did? He cut out right field on the baseball field and the softball field. You know what he did when we got into the woods? He stopped and walked. And then came the track meets. And you know what happened? He won. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. It happens that way sometimes. But try this out. Wynel McDaniel was the matriarch of the second church that I served as pastor at Caroline Baptist. She asked me one time, she said, Trey, I'd like you to go visit such and such. They used to be a member of our church, they're not anymore, but she's about to die. It would mean a lot to me if you go visit her. I tried to do, I tried to be discerning, and I, I, you know, visiting is a very 
central part of my ministry. But when somebody asks me specifically to do something, I do it. So I was just being faithful to my calling. I was doing my job. And I went and I visited this lady. While I was there in the nursing home, her son was there. He just happened to be there. The son and I hit it off. His mother died. He asked me, I didn't have a big role in the funeral service. I had just met the lady and she was near death at the time. But he asked me if I would just read scripture in the funeral service, which I did and I was happy to do. No big deal. You're not going to put me on the all-star team of pastors for that. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm carrying out my calling. That's all I'm doing. Do you know, soon after that funeral, a gift came into Caroline Baptist Church? And I'll not give you the dollar number, but it was significant. A gift to Caroline Baptist Church to be used for the pastor's further education. So I bought a computer. I built up my library. I went on a retreat. Well, sometimes, church, I'm just saying sometimes. Not all the time. There are no guarantees. But sometimes, when we do what we're supposed to do, when we're faithful to our callings, whatever they may be, sometimes when we pursue righteousness and holiness and we turn the other cheek, sometimes things go our way. <coughs> Sometimes.